In the last Napoleon video, I mentioned that the encirclement of Napoleon at Leipzig felt like the turning point in World War II, which was D-Day. Some of you down in the comments wanted to point out to me that it was actually something on the Eastern Front, like Stalingrad or the Battle of Moscow, that was the turning point for World War II. It was actually the Russian army that made the bigger difference in World War II, and that they would have defeated Hitler without even the Western Allies. Now, I'm not going to pretend to know enough about World War II to get into a debate about all of that. I just wanted to say that I think I used the wrong words when I was trying to communicate what my thought was about that. So I was really just kind of trying to relay the emotional response that I feel when I think about D-Day. I also kind of had that same emotional response watching Napoleon get encircled at Leipzig. Much the same way that all of you on the Eastern Front would probably equate Leipzig with Stalingrad. Maybe D-Day wasn't a turning point, maybe it wasn't super important overall to the war. Basically, since D-Day took place really late in the war and Hitler was beginning to be pressed on both fronts, that encirclement of the German army as a whole was starting to happen, and that is kind of what I meant. D-Day kind of putting that, that pressure and kind of making that final push to completely encircle the German army and push them back into Germany, and that is just kind of the analogy I was trying to make. So anyway, I hope you understand what I'm trying to say and you don't take what I'm trying to explain to you in the wrong way. Just wanted to get that out of the way before we do anything else in this video. Okay, so we are on the penultimate video of the Napoleonic Wars series. I can't believe we're here, guys. Roger's gonna be sad when he can't wear his Napoleon hat anymore. But we still have all of the Marshalls videos to do after this, so even after we get done with Waterloo in the next video, we're gonna get into the Napoleon Marshalls, so we've still got a little ways to go with this. But it looks like we're gonna be in France today. It looks like Napoleon has finally been pushed back to France. And I think some of you also got confused when I said it looks like Napoleon is going to win some more battles. I meant battles, not the war. I know Napoleon doesn't win the war. I mean, I know he gets defeated and he gets exiled to an island out in the Atlantic somewhere. So I just meant to clarify that I think he wins some more battles before he actually loses the war. My guess is that we're gonna see some of those here in this video. But before we get into this video, you know what time it is. We're gonna revisit some of your comments from the previous video because a lot of you answered my questions down in the comments and I would like to kind of highlight some of those. And if you don't wanna watch this, just hit the reaction chapter down below and you can skip right to that. So let's get into comment time. So in the last video, I was a bit confused why he kept referring to Germany when Germany wasn't really on the map. And a lot of you down in the comments let me know that Germany is more of just a geographical term that had been used for a really long time at this point, even though it wasn't an official country. Siwi says that Germany at the most basic level is a geographical term independent if there is a state or a kingdom or a federation. Think of it this way, no matter if the USA exists or not, you can still call the land America or North America. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, I know that America was a term way before the United States actually existed, so I get it that general area was referred to as Germany or maybe a variation on that name. In the last video, I also got a little confused about Bernadotte because I had forgotten that he had switched sides and had gone to um, the Allies against Napoleon. I also got wrong the country that he went to. I could not remember for the life of me which country he went to, and I said Austria but uh, I was a little off on that. James Booth says, to answer your question about Bernadotte, a few years earlier, the Swedish crown was in a dilemma. So they had seen Bernadotte as a competent military commander and had treated the Swedish prisoners honorably during his period under Napoleon. So they invited him to be the king instead. Below that, there was somebody that said that it wasn't the king, he was invited to be the prince and then later became the king. So I think that's what happened. So yeah, Sweden, not Austria. So this next comment is by Wafs or Waifs. I'm not sure exactly how you say it, but they answered several of my questions, actually. I was a little confused about why they said Borodino was like the bloodiest battle or whatever, and then they said that Leipzig was like the worst battle. There's a little distinction there that I didn't quite pick up on. He lets me know that Borodino was the single bloodiest 
day in the Napoleonic Wars, but Leipzig was the bloodiest battle and it was over multiple days, so that's the distinction between them. Or actually, Leipzig was the bloodiest battle in European history before World War I, so that's the distinction. He also let me know that General Mason was on the French side. I wasn't quite sure which side he was on when they gave that quote that he did. And then there was also that point where we saw Napoleon being encircled at Leipzig except for one little bit on the west and I was kind of like why did they leave that there for him to escape? Why didn't they just encircle him? And he let me know that in terms of why they didn't complete the encirclement he doesn't know either <laughs> but it could have been that they did send thousands of troops to cut him off. Napoleon would probably realize that the armies of the other fronts were now under strengthened and he would attack them and win. There were some other comments below that also said that it was kind of like common practice not to completely encircle and to leave your enemy and escape because if you did completely encircle them they might actually fight harder against you and would have a better chance of winning the battle. So I'm not really sure what the clear answer is on that. It seems like there's not one. There might be a few different theories on why that happened but if any of you want to kind of add more clarity to that feel free to do that down in the comments. I also tried to convert 12,000 francs in the last video to dollars and completely forgot that the franc doesn't exist anymore because everything was kind of converted over to euros a long time ago. <laughs> so Evan Enterprises just wanted to point out that the French franc doesn't exist anymore and I was converting the Swiss franc and not the French franc. Plus there were some maths that I didn't do that had to like, I don't know, account for ratios and uh, whatever. Um, I just, I did the wrong calculation. Somebody else did like all of the complicated math on that and they let me know that it would have equated to more like $400,000 instead of the 200000 that I came up with, but I guess at least it was somewhere in the ballpark, although not really. Menu 86, let me know. I think you guessed that Viva la, la I can't say it like I'm supposed to in French. Uh, it means long live the emperor. Yeah, I do know what it means. I just, I just can't pronounce it properly. And I was also really kind of surprised that the French marines were mentioned in, or was it the imperial marines? I'm not sure what they were called. I forgot. But uh, there were marines fighting for Napoleon inland. Jordan B wanted me to know that about the marines, I think they mentioned in one of the previous videos how Napoleon started using them in his armies to replace the manpower that he had lost in Russia. And I think somebody else mentioned that the marines just weren't really doing much of anything. So they were transferred over to help the armies. I'm sure there are a lot of things mentioned in previous videos that I'm not gonna remember. So just bear in mind that this is my very first time watching all of this stuff. There's a lot of information coming at me in these videos. I'm not gonna remember everything perfectly, but I am trying. You guys are just gonna have to bear with me and your comments actually really do help me learn more. So I really do appreciate that and appreciate your patience in helping me learn all of this stuff. All right, so with that, we're gonna get into this video. We are coming up towards the end of the Napoleonic Wars. I'm really kind of interested to see what happens now. We're gonna see Napoleon, I guess, start to really, really feel the pressure and start to kind of cave at this point. I know the Battle of Waterloo is the culmination of all of it. That's in the next video, but this one should be interesting to see how we get up to that point. So let's do it. Peace is easy enough to say the word. Am I to give up all that I possess in Germany? Napoleon to count would not. In October 1813, Napoleon had suffered his heaviest ever defeat at Leipzig, the Battle of the Nations. Surviving French forces, exhausted, sick and demoralized, retreated to the River Rhine and prepared to defend France from invasion. But in November, the armies of the Sixth Coalition paused their advance, and Austrian Foreign Minister Metternich offered peace terms. The Frankfurt proposals would allow Napoleon to keep his throne if France returned to her so-called natural frontiers. It was the best offer Napoleon was likely to get now that his back was to the wall, and all Europe's great powers were united against him. Let me guess he doesn't take Even it. Even so, he did not accept the terms. He merely agreed to reopen negotiations. 
to the Allies and many in France itself. It proved that Napoleon would not listen to reason. What is this thing? Is this like some torture device? Is this like a real thing or is this just a cartoon thing that they've made up for this cartoon? Because if it is real, oh my gosh. Like that is just as bad as like the guillotine in my... <laughs> Might even be more, way more painful, actually. I know the guillotine, you don't, you're supposedly you don't feel any pain when your head gets chopped off, but this would be, oh my god, that'd be horrible. Oh my gosh, these, these are, like, I know this isn't medieval times, but it reminds me of, like, medieval torture devices or something. Man. Reason. The war went on. And by January 1814, Napoleon's situation looked even worse. Many of his besieged garrisons in the east were starved into surrender. Marshal Davout, with 34,000 men in Hamburg, was now besieged. Denmark, one of France's last allies, was invaded by Bernadotte's Swedish army and made to join the coalition. French troops evacuated the Netherlands, which reasserted its independence after nearly 20 years of French control. I mean, all he has is in France Italy, at this point. Eugène's army faced a new enemy, Joachim Mura, king of Naples, now marching north with 30,000 men to honor his new alliance with the Sixth Coalition. In Paris, Napoleon responded to the crisis with a series of extreme measures. Property taxes doubled, state salaries and pensions suspended, 300,000 new conscripts called up from a country already exhausted by 20 years of war. He ordered the release of Pope Pius, under French house arrest for the last five years, to try to shore up his support in Italy. He even agreed to release Fernando, the Bourbon King of Spain, to take up his throne in exchange for peace between France and Spain. A condition. I just said he just had France, but um, he does have part of, it looks like Switzerland. I guess Switzerland doesn't exist, but it's Switz. And he has part of Italy as well at this point. To take up his throne in exchange for peace between France and Spain. A condition that Fernando was in no position to honor. You know, we had all these people hostage. But these concessions were too little, far too late. In January, two coalition armies crossed the Rhine into France. Blücher's army of Silesia and Schwarzenberg's army of Bohemia. Outnumbered French forces in their path could only fall back. On the 25th of January, Napoleon said farewell to his wife and son at the Tuileries Palace before leaving for the front. He would never see either of them again. With just 70,000 men, he faced odds of four to one. Most of his troops were raw conscripts, some without uniforms, many just learning how to hold a musket. But for the first time in years, Napoleon's army was so small that he'd be able to exercise direct command over all its movements. The result would be one of the most audacious and brilliant campaigns in history. So he's going to win some battles here, it sounds like. Imagine Napoleon waging cross to war. If the enemy are foolish enough to cross the Rhine, I will march to meet them. Then you will see the meaning of the word debacle. The battle for France would be fought east of Paris, mostly across Champagne, a flat region divided by the rivers Marne and Seine and their tributaries. In late January, fields were dusted with snow and roads quickly turned to mud. Napoleon learned that the coalition armies were widely scattered, with part of Blücher's army near Napoleon's old college at Brienne. The Emperor advanced rapidly, hoping to trap and destroy part of Blücher's army. 
but after a hard day's fighting that cost both sides 3,000 casualties, Blücher was able to retreat towards Schwarzenberg's army. That evening, Napoleon was nearly skewered by a charging Cossack, saved only by General Gorgo's good shooting. Wow, that was a close call, huh? As Napoleon tried to work out the enemy's movements, Blücher, heavily reinforced by Schwarzenberg, made a surprise attack at La Rothière. I have a question about that, actually. How hard did uh, the Allies try to actually attack Napoleon directly? Because I would imagine that would have been a huge win. I mean, imagine. It would have been a huge win if they had been able to take him out. I mean, he he wouldn't be the French. The French army would basically be dead in the water without Napoleon. It sounds like without his leadership and his uh, tactical skills. So I don't know. Like, was was that a thing? Like every single time Napoleon was out on the battlefield, did they have people trying to get to him and and take him out, or was that just impossible to do because he um, was so well guarded by? the French army or a portion of the French army. So let me know how that played out. I mean, obviously he's made it this far in the Napoleonic Wars. So it seems like he's been pretty well guarded against any sort of assassination attempt or whatever, but uh, yeah, that'd be interesting to, to know more about that. Allied troops advanced through swirling snow to assault the village, defiantly held by young French conscripts. One was so inexperienced that Marshal Marmont had to personally show him how to load his musket during the battle. <laughs> okay, not very well trained, By apparently. By late afternoon, Vreda's Bavarian Corps was falling on Napoleon's flank. Heavily outnumbered, Napoleon had no option but to retreat, having lost 5,000 casualties and 73 guns abandoned in the thick mud. Oh. The Allies' frontal attacks meant their losses were greater, but by combining their armies, they defeated Napoleon on French soil for the first time. Embarrassing? Believing Napoleon. Napoleon would now retreat towards Paris, the Allies decided to advance along two routes to ease pressure on the roads. Blücher would take a northern route along the Marne. Schwarzenberg would follow the Seine but dividing their armies again would play right into Napoleon's hands. Let me guess, he's not going back to France, or Paris. The study of it has given me a greater idea of his genius than any other, the Duke of Wellington. Well, it's high praise from the Duke of Wellington, I guess. After two days to reorganize, Napoleon continued his retreat to Nogent, where he learned that the Allies had split their armies. Not only that, they were advancing at different speeds. The aggressive Blücher racing ahead, while the more cautious Schwarzenberg lagged behind. Leaving Oudinot and Victor to guard the Seine bridges and delay Schwarzenberg, Napoleon raced north through mud and rain with 30,000 men. The army of Silesia was strung out on the march, oblivious to the danger it was in. First, Napoleon fell on General Osufiev's Russian 9th Corps at Champaubert, destroying it, taking its commander and 2,000 men prisoner. The next morning, he marched on General Austin Sacken's force near Montmiral. This was a much larger force, with two infantry and one cavalry corps, and was expecting support from York's Prussian 1st Corps. But the Prussians were late and Sacken's troops could not withstand the French onslaught. At this desperate hour, the Emperor's elite old guard were no longer held back, but were often thrown into the thick of the fighting. By the end of the day, Napoleon had inflicted another 3,500 casualties, twice his own losses, and the Allies were in rapid retreat. Napoleon had ordered Marshal Macdonald to cut off the enemy's escape, by seizing the Marne Bridge at Chateau Thierry. But York's Prussians got there first. 
The next day, Napoleon could only batter their rearguard as the enemy fled across the Marne, destroying the bridge behind them. Sending Marshal Mortier to rebuild the bridge and continue the pursuit, Napoleon doubled back to rejoin Marmont, who had been left I mean, to keep watch on Blücher. He's just taking them out one by one. This is crazy. Why did Blücher um, slow down? It was, I, I don't know. Maybe the timing is, is not uh, being super accurate in this video. I, I don't know. It just seems like, why did Blücher just like hang back? Why, why, why didn't he just get ahead of Napoleon at this point? But yeah, Napoleon taking these guys out one by one. <laughs> I mean, like everybody that had gone north, they're just decimated. So bad plan. Also, I have a question about this. Napoleon, obviously he's like a genius strategist in war. Where did he learn all of this stuff? Is this just instinct? Is this stuff that he came up with by himself? Or was he a big student of war previously and had really studied, you know, battles and military campaigns and strategy? Is that how he got this brilliant at all of this? Or is this just his natural gift? I'm just wondering that throughout all of these videos. I'm, I've, I haven't asked that question yet, but it's been on my, on my mind. Like, how did he learn to be such an effective commander? Especially at a young age, too. Napoleon attacked at Vauchamp, using General Grouchy's cavalry to outflank Blücher's army, which was soon in headlong retreat. A merciless French pursuit inflicted 6,000 Prussian and Russian casualties. Napoleon lost just 600 men. Napoleon had taken on an enemy army almost twice his size, and beaten it four times in just six days. Blücher had lost an estimated 15,000 casualties in battle, and another 15,000 in smaller engagements, as stragglers or deserters. For now... So another question, this is, this is crazy, like these numbers are crazy. How much of this is Napoleon's brilliance and how much of it is just incompetence by the, the Prussians, Russians? Um, I think it's the Prussians mainly he's going against here. So, I don't know, maybe it's a combo of both, I guess. Like, obviously, the more incom incompetent your enemy is, the more brilliant you're going to look, I guess. Um, obviously it was a bad decision for them to split up like they did as well. So I guess that was, that could be called incompetence. I don't know. But this is actually, this is crazy. This just shows Napoleon's unwillingness to give up. Like this guy is persistent. He's going to fight till the very end. He is not going to call it quits. He has not accepted any sort of peace deal at this point. And his back is against the wall, and he is still winning battles. So that just shows you his personality and kind of his fighting spirit as well. Just how persistent he is, and just how much he wants to persevere. Yeah, I guess you have to have that personality also to... I mean, that's what makes a lot of people successful in life, is that they just don't give up when others do. So... But now, the army... Obviously, he's not ultimately successful. <laughs> but you know what I mean. Like, he's, he's, he looks successful in these battles here. The of Silesia had been scattered and neutralized. Nuts. But in the south, Marshals Victor and Udino had not been able to prevent Schwarzenberg's army of Bohemia from crossing the Seine in three places. Austrian troops were now just 40 miles from Paris. Leaving Mortier and Marmont to keep watch on Blücher, Napoleon raced south. Schwarzenberg, alarmed by news of Blücher's defeat and of Napoleon's approach, immediately ordered a retreat. It was too late for Wittgenstein's advance guard, routed Wait, at Mont even... with 2,000 casualties. They don't even want to take Napoleon on. As soon as they hear that he's on the way, oh, let's get out of here. That's funny. Napoleon sent Victor's 2nd Corps to seize the bridge at Montereau. 
but was so infuriated by its slow progress that he sacked Victor and gave his corps to General Gérard. The next day, at the Battle of Montereau, the French drove the Allied Württemberg Corps back across the river, with 30% losses. According to some accounts, the Emperor sighted the French cannon himself, as he had really? at Lodi 18 years before. Napoleon wow. had the Allies on the run. But how long could it last? Was he that desperate that he had to go and man a cannon by himself? Was it just because troops were not very well trained and so he had to kind of like step in and kind of do their job for them? That's interesting. That's really interesting to me that he did that. If that's true. It sounded like it might not have been true. It's just kind of like one of those lore things that you hear about, but that's uh, if it is true, that's really, really interesting. Recollect what your military position is. If we act with military and political prudence, how can France resist a just peace demanded by 600,000 warriors? Let her, if she dare. Even as fighting continued, negotiations between France and the coalition reopened at Châtillon sur Seine on the 5th of February. The Allied terms were now more severe. A return to France's frontiers of 1791 which meant the additional loss of Belgium, a humiliation that Napoleon refused to accept. Okay, I had asked in one of my previous videos where the boundaries of France were, because I thought, I guess the Rhine River is... Um, I thought it was the entire eastern boundary of France. Looks like it's only about half of it, though. What is on the bottom part down, down here, on the bottom eastern... Is that like a mountain range or something? What is the border? What defines that border? And also um, between the top of France and what I guess would be maybe Belgium these days. What is that? Is there a river right there that defines that border? Let me know. I'm interested in that. And also between Spain and France. What is there a river there that defines that border? I'm really interested to know kind of that geography right there. Instead, he tried to revive the Frankfurt proposals, hoping to play for time and to split the coalition, whose war aims varied from Britain's hard line to Austria's more ambiguous position. But this hope was thwarted by British Foreign Secretary Lord Castlereagh. On the 1st of March, he persuaded the Allies to sign the Treaty of Chaumont. In it, Russia, Prussia, Austria and Great Britain agreed to keep 150,000 troops in the field and not to negotiate separately with France, while Britain added the sweetener of a £5 million subsidy to be shared among the Allies. The treaty's the secret articles specified common war aims, including the future independence of the German states, Switzerland and Italy, while Spain was to be returned to the Bourbons and Holland to the House of Orange. The four powers even agreed that once they'd defeated Napoleon, they'd form a 20-year defensive alliance to maintain peace in Europe, a sign of their newfound commitment to each other. As this gives me vibes of, like, um, the UN, or NATO, actually, not, not the UN, but NATO. Like, this is... Uh, NATO before NATO happened, basically. This is interesting. We did, were, were treaties like this, I guess, I would imagine that these sorts of agreements have been made all throughout history between different countries. Our modern example of that is NATO. Um, but this, this seems like kind of a precursor to that, um, to me. But were treaties like this always signed throughout history between countries to try and promote peace in the area or whatever. A split in the coalition had been Napoleon's last best hope for a favourable peace. That was gone. And news from across the country was bleak. French cities were surrendering to the Allies without a fight. Nancy, Dijon and Macon had all fallen. 
In the south, Wellington defeated Marshal Soult at Ortez, forcing him to fall back on Toulouse. Two weeks later, as British troops approached the city of Bordeaux, it declared loyalty to France's Bourbon kings. The mayor himself rode out to greet the British, bearing a white cockade, the sign of Bourbon allegiance. What are these, what are these kings that they're talking about in France? I'm so confused about what's going on in France at this point. You know, the whole French Revolution thing as well was just like, uh, I've, the power exchanged so many hands. It was really hard to keep track of what was going on in France. So it's, Napoleon's the emperor of France, but we have kings in the south of France. I'm not really sure how that works. Napoleon's hope for a nation in arms to resist the Allies had not materialized. Allied troops, particularly Cossacks, often robbed French civilians and committed some atrocities. French peasants took revenge when they could, but there was no guerrilla war to mirror what French troops had encountered in Spain or Russia. The chief desire among ordinary French people was for peace, at almost any price. I mean, yeah, considering what, they, what they've been through, Dangers crowded upon him, encompassed him, oppressed him from every side, but he sought to escape from them by misrepresenting them to himself. Any talk of Napoleon's defeat in late February was premature. The French Emperor was driving Schwarzenberg's army of Bohemia before him, even though it was twice his size. I mean, they're just running but away from him. Schwarzenberg scrambled to safety behind the River Ome. Napoleon knew he had to land another decisive blow soon, so turned his attention back to Blücher. After an aborted attempt to join forces with Schwarzenberg, Blücher had decided to resume his advance on Paris, gathering reinforcements en route, and with only Marmont and Mortier's weak corps to oppose him. Leaving Marshal Macdonald in command in the south, Napoleon set off to intercept Blücher, covering 60 miles in three days along terrible roads choked with mud. I have a feeling, at the, I don't know, I could be completely wrong. I just feel like there's this buildup happening to where Blücher is about to get the best of Napoleon here. I don't know why I have that feeling, but I do. Napoleon's approach, Blücher retreated across the Marne, maybe not. burning the bridges behind him. 24 hours later, they'd been rebuilt by French engineers, and Napoleon was poised to crush Blücher against the Erne River. Okay, because maybe the not. major crossing point at Soissons was held by a Franco-Polish garrison. But after just a day's fighting, the garrison commander at Soissons tamely surrendered, allowing Blücher to escape. Napoleon continued his pursuit across the Aisne, still hoping to cut off the army of Silesia. But at Craon, he encountered Russian troops in a strong defensive position. The Russians fought stubbornly. The French finally forced the enemy to withdraw, but only at the cost of 6,000 casualties, including many irreplaceable veterans from Napoleon's guard. Napoleon pushed on to Long. But by now, Blücher had concentrated his forces, 98,000 troops in all, and outnumbered Napoleon two to one. French attacks were repulsed, while Marmont's corps was caught off guard by a late Allied counterattack and routed. Napoleon was lucky to avoid a much heavier defeat. Blücher, usually aggressive to the point of recklessness, was unwell and had been told Napoleon's army was twice as big as it was, leading him to act with unusual caution. Long was a heavy blow to Napoleon. Six and a half thousand casualties he could not afford. 
Okay, so I was sort of right. He fell back to Soissons. And after a brief moment to reorganize, he marched on the city of Reims, which had just fallen to Saint Priest's Russian corps. Yeah, but what about. In a whirlwind assault, Napoleon retook the city. Saint Priest himself was mortally wounded, his corps routed. Seems like that's Meanwhile, less important than Blucher the south, up there. Schwarzenberg had resumed his offensive as soon as he found out Napoleon had gone north. <laughs> In heavy fighting, he'd driven Udino and Macdonald back from the River Ope. Five days later, the Allies had recaptured Troyes as Macdonald retreated behind the River Seine. Now, after four days to rest and reorganize his battered army, Napoleon was coming south once more. I mean, I, I feel like he's just going back and forth in a never-ending struggle to keep these guys from taking Paris. Something's got to give at some point. Like, he can't just keep doing this forever. I, I have a feeling that he's, he's not going to be able to, eventually. Schwarzenberg, emboldened by news of Napoleon's defeat at Laon, decided that this time he would stand and fight. Napoleon advanced on Arcis sur Eube, ignoring reports that the enemy was not retreating as he believed, but gathering for battle. As heavy fighting broke out, Napoleon still believed he faced only the enemy rearguard. It was a nasty surprise to discover that he faced the entire might of the Army of Bohemia. 28,000 men against 80,000. In desperate um, fighting, Napoleon okay. personally rallied fleeing troops and exposed himself to enemy fire, having his horse killed under him by an exploding shell. This poor horse! But the odds were too great. At the end of the second day, Napoleon was forced to order the retreat. First of all, I can imagine what he must have felt when his horse that had been with him all of this time, all of these years, got killed from under him. It's like, I mean, like, I don't know how soldiers felt about their horses, but I would imagine that they had a very, you know, keen relationship with them maybe felt like they were their pets in a way i don't know but i know if that had happened to me i would be like crying my eyes out I'm, i mean i'm sure like a hardcore guy like napoleon probably didn't do that i don't know i don't know how he felt about it but i would be devastated just by that alone um i saw the glorious death disputing foot by foot the soil of the country the balls flew around me, my clothes were pierced, but none reached me. I mean, he's lucky, I guess. Napoleon believed his army was now too weak to take on the Allies directly. So he decided to change strategy. He would march into the rear of the Allied armies join up with some of his isolated garrisons and cut the enemy's lines of communication, forcing them to abandon their advance on Paris. But the Allies, until now always one step behind Napoleon, had just received crucial information. Uh-oh. <laughs> Talleyrand, the most brilliant French diplomat of the age and the most slippery. He'd served France's monarchy, the Revolution, then Napoleon, until in 1807, he fell out irrevocably with the Emperor over foreign policy. He now believed that Napoleon was dragging France into ruin and worked behind the scenes to ensure his downfall. From Paris, he wrote to the Russian Emperor Alexander at Allied headquarters, informing him that in the capital, support for Napoleon was crumbling and the city's defences had been completely neglected. Mm. He urged the Allies to march immediately on Paris, 
without allowing Napoleon to distract them. Talleyrand's information was confirmed when the Allies intercepted a report from Napoleon's chief of police, General Savary, meant for the Emperor. The treasury, arsenals and powder stores are empty. We are completely at the end of our resources. The population is discouraged and discontented, wishing peace at any price. Wow. As Napoleon advanced on Saint-Dizier, the Allies sent General Witzingerode and 10,000 cavalry to harass his army and to screen their own movements. Then began their march on Paris. Wait, 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 wait a second. What the heck is Napoleon doing? He's just leaving Paris completely undefended right here. He's going away from... Is he trying to, like, pull the enemy away from Paris? But there's there are no French troops, like, cutting them off from going... I mean, they just have free reign to go right to Paris right here. I'm... Confused by this. At Fair Champenoise, they collided with Marmont and Mortier's corps, advancing to join Napoleon. An entire National Guard division. 5,000 men was virtually wiped out as the marshals suffered a crushing defeat. Napoleon feared that the fall of Paris would be a fatal blow to his regime. There's nobody between Blucher and whatever these armies are, I guess the Prussians are, I, don't, I can't, I forgot what flags those are. The, the ones by the Marne River up here. There's, there's nobody between them and Paris. What's going on? Like, that just seems stupid to me. Maybe, the, maybe there's something here that I'm not picking up on. His political authority and ability to wage war might not recover. So when he received news of the Allies' movements, he tore up his plans and ordered he... a forced march back to Paris, intending There's nobody... to lead its defense in person. Yeah, you're way behind everybody, Napoleon. Napoleon's wife and son were evacuated from the capital, along with most of his ministers. His brother, Joseph, the ex-king of Spain, was in charge of the city's defenses, but had done little. Paris was heck? awash with rumors of treachery and defeat. Marmont and Mortier were able to reach Paris before the Allies, adding their troops to the garrison. Where's Napoleon? Why is he way over here and everybody else is... I mean, he just... I don't know if they said something about him going behind the Allies and trying to, like, cut off their communications. Is, he, that's, is that what he's trying to do right now? Because it was a dumb move if that's what he's doing. I mean, he just basically left an entire free path to Paris and with very little French troops to encounter them. I mean, he's nowhere, nowhere near being able to defend Paris right now. That seems like a very un-Napoleon-like move to me. It now totaled 37,000 men, including some hardened veterans of the Guard but many more young conscripts, while a third were part-time soldiers of the National Guard. The Allies had 120,000 seasoned troops outside the city, and given the urgency of taking Paris before Napoleon could intervene, their elite guards and grenadier divisions would lead the way. So what Paris looked like back then? It was like just a On little country town. Of March, they began their assault from the north. Heavy fighting raged throughout the day. The city's defenders fought bravely, inflicting several thousand casualties on the advancing enemy. But defeat was inevitable. That night, to save Paris from destruction, Marshal Marmont agreed to surrender the city condition the garrison was permitted to leave with its weapons. 
At the Hôtel des Invalides, the 71-year-old Marshal Serrurier oversaw the burning of 1,400 flags and standards captured from France's enemies, as well as Frederick the Great's sword and sash, so they would not fall into Allied hands. Interesting. Napoleon was just 15 miles from Paris when he late, was informed buddy. of the city's surrender. He sat with his head in his hands for 15 minutes. Well, you have yourself to blame for that one. We did not intend to expose Paris to the fate of Moscow. On the 31st of March, 1814, France's enemies marched into Paris for the first time since the Hundred Years' War. Parisian crowds cheered the three allied monarchs, bringers of peace. Everyone in Paris was suddenly a royalist once more. Wow. Above all, they cheered for em Poor France. I mean, they just keep going back and forth between people. Uh, it's, it's bizarre to me. You know, I of course, I don't live in a country where, I mean, obviously we, we have president and different president well, almost a different president every four years. So, I mean, power exchanges hands in a way here. But, you know, it seems like this, not only does power exchange hands constantly in France, but just like a completely different style of government gets implemented as well. That's just a lot to have to deal with. And, uh, yeah, ever since the, rev the revolution, and now, you know, through <laughs> all of this... Just what a time to be alive in France. Wouldn't have For wanted Emperor to be. Alexander of Russia, now hailed as Europe's savior. Okay. Don Cossacks bivouacked on the Champs Elysees. Allied troops generally behaved well. Thirty-five miles away, Napoleon was at Fontainebleau with 36,000 men, all of them hungry and exhausted after their 100-mile forced march. Nevertheless, Napoleon began planning an immediate advance on Paris. But for the first time, he faced unanimous opposition from his ministers and marshals, including Ney, Macdonald, Oudinot and Berthier. They reminded him of his oath to act for the good of France, he accused them of disloyalty, acting only to save themselves. They told him the war was lost, and he must abdicate in favour of his son if possible. On the 4th of April, Marshal Marmont surrendered his entire corps to the coalition, which was marched over to the enemy lines against the wishes of many of its officers and men. This was a devastating blow to Napoleon, and encouraged the Allies to reject his offer of a conditional abdication in favour of his son. Two days later, he abdicated without conditions. The Allied powers having proclaimed that the Emperor Napoleon is the only obstacle to the re-establishment of peace in Europe, the Emperor Napoleon, faithful to his oath, declares that he renounces, for himself and his heirs, the thrones of France and Italy, and that there is no personal sacrifice, including his life, that he is not ready to make in the interests of France. Napoleon's abdication was formalised by the Treaty of Fontainebleau, by which he was allowed to keep the title of Emperor, become sovereign of the small island of Elba, and retain a bodyguard of 400 men. <laughs> News came too late to prevent Wellington's attack on Toulouse, leading to a costly and pointless battle, with more than 7,000 casualties. The night after his abdication, Napoleon tried to commit suicide, using the poison that had been made for him in Russia, in case of capture. But it had lost its potency, and he survived. Two weeks later, 
Napoleon bade farewell to his old guard at Fontainebleau Palace, and began his journey into exile. I have it wrong, maybe in my plans. I have done harm in war, but it is all like a dream. The Napoleonic Wars, which had raged on land and sea for 11 years, seemed finally at an end. The death toll is unknown, but historians estimate that two to three million lives were lost across Europe. It's a lot Most in those days. soldiers died not in battle, but from disease. Many thousands were left maimed and disfigured. For most of this period, Napoleon was master of Europe, imposing treaties on humbled enemies, redrawing frontiers, overthrowing old regimes, and making new kings. He was the last figure in history to combine total political power with frontline military genius, in the mould of Alexander and Caesar. But it seemed Napoleon's reign was to end in abject military defeat. However, exile on Elba did not prove to Napoleon's taste. In less than 10 months, he would return to France to fight one last great campaign to reclaim his throne. Wow. Okay, yeah, as that video was winding down and I was seeing that Napoleon had signed that, um, I forgot what they called it, that treaty, basically, that peace treaty, I was kind of like, how in the world does he fight Waterloo? <laughs> because if he has basically given up and he's been exiled to this island, how does Waterloo happen? Also, how the heck does he get off of there? I mean, like, I, I thought that that meant that he was not allowed to leave that island. Like, he was being sort of held like prisoner there, but I guess not if he can leave and come back to France and try to, like, retake the throne. Anyway, what a video. Like, I was literally on the edge of my seat for a good portion of it, trying to figure out what exactly what, what was going to happen with Napoleon, how he was going to pull off all of these battles. Obviously, eventually he couldn't, you know, maintain it. I still have no idea what the, why he just kind of, like, went behind the enemies and didn't even leave any troops, you know, to confront them. Well, he had, like, those two little uh, regiments or whatever that were there, but obviously that, that was not enough to take on all of the allies that were still left between him and Paris. So I, I, oh man, like I'm super, super confused about that. Why would you even do that? But now I'm really curious about how the heck this, the rest of this plays out. Like, I don't know. I guess we'll have to leave it for next time. One more video left in the Napoleonic Wars series, then we'll get to the Marshals after that. So make sure you stick around. We're gonna finish out this series together. Also, I wanted to let you know that I do have some social media if you would like to follow me there. On Facebook, I have a page and a group but you'll probably want to join the group because that's where all of the fun discussion happens. Also, if you enjoyed this video, make sure you like and subscribe. I like military history and I like history in general, so we're gonna be doing a lot of videos on these subjects, even if it's not just on Napoleon, but we'll get into other eras of history and military history as well. So I hope that you will stick around and join me in the future for those. But until next time, Roger here and I say au revoir.